and welcome to the latest episode of the Green Left News Podcast. I'm your host, Isaac Nellis, and I'm speaking to you from unceded Gadigal Wangal land. This week, I'm joined by refugee rights activist Chloe, and we'll be taking you through the latest activist news from Australia and around the world. Hi, Isaac. I'm speaking from Wurundjeri Woiwurrung land, and if listeners haven't heard of Green Left, it is a people-powered media project that has been running for more than 30 years. We centre the voice of activists and provide an alternative to the corporate news media. You can become a supporter today for only $5 a month at greenleft.org.au forward slash support. Before we begin, we acknowledge that this podcast is recorded on stolen land that has never been ceded and always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Green Left is committed to supporting struggles for First Nations justice. The LGBTIQ community in Borloo or Perth has formed a powerful wall of gay to protect a drag storytime event hosted by the City of Bayswater Council at Maylands Library from a handful of bigots. Rainbow Rebellion outnumbered the homophobes 10 to 1 and held up a banner welcoming children to the storytime event. This comes in the context of increasing far-right homophobic organising which forced a number of councils in Victoria to cancel their drag storytime events. The festive vibe, with music playing between chants and speakers and strong support from community groups, shows that LGBTIQ events can be held safely despite threats from bigots. Disability rights advocates, people with mobility issues, wheelchair users, blind people and parents with prams blockaded Sydney Road in Nam, Melbourne to call for accessible tram stops before any more level crossing removal works on the Upfield line. One protester in a wheelchair said... They have had a disability for 50 years and have never been able to get on a tram. Campaign organiser Christian Astorian told the rally that accessible tram stops are a matter of dignity, basic human rights and inclusion. Mary Beck councillor Sue Bolton told the rally she is confident they will win the campaign, promising to take direct action and more protests if the Labour government refuses to meet their demands. And the Community and Public Sector Union, or CPSU, has stepped up its campaign to restore the Commonwealth Employment Service, CES, which was abolished by the Howard government in 1998. The CES was set up to help uh, people find jobs and locate labour shortages, but has been outsourced to private and charity organisations, which has led to disastrous consequences. The CPSU said the time is up for the privatised, punitive and primarily for-profit employment services system. CPSU National Secretary Melissa Donnelly said at the Bring Back the CES launch on June 15 that the privatised system had created a toxic relationship with job seekers, wasted taxpayer money and created huge profits for a handful of private providers who are failing to deliver. You can support the campaign by signing the petition at proudtobepublic.org.au slash bringbackces. And the voice to parliament referendum is set to go ahead within the next six months passing the Senate 52 to 19 on June 19. A handful of coalition MPs, One Nation, the United Australia Party and independent First Nations Senator Lydia Thorpe voted against the bill. The referendum will ask whether or not Australians want an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice to be added to the constitution. One of the reforms proposed by the 2017 Uluru Statement from the Heart. A motion was put forward by Yamachi Nunga Woman and Greens Senator Dorinda Cox that the Senate endorses the Uluru Statement from the heart in full and that the bill would not affect the sovereignty of any group or body. The motion passed with a slim margin. Cox said this assures that after the voice referendum, there will be progress towards truth and treaty in this term. Thorpe was joined by several First Nations leaders outside Parliament on June 20th to explain their opposition to The Voice, pointing out that the government has refused to implement the findings of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Debts and Custody and the Bringing Them Home report. Blockade Australia has been coordinating disruptive actions across three major ports to protest Australia's lack of action to deal with the climate emergency. Activists blockaded the Port of Melbourne, Brisbane Port and Newcastle Port, 
and Blockade Australia said these acts of resistance are a reminder that Australia refuses to act on the climate crisis and continues to be a driving cause of climate collapse by extracting and moving exploited resources around the world through these ports. A spokesperson said that without mass organised civil resistance, Australia and its allies will not stop organising the exploitation of this planet. Several activists had been arrested. In more climate activist news, the No New Gas Coalition protested on June 17 against the Northern Territory government's decision to frack the Betalu Basin and set up a new gas hub at Middle Arm. Gas Corporation Tamboron Resources announced in early June it had plans to build a liquefied natural gas plant at Middle Arm to export fracked gas from the Betalu Basin. Climate Action Darwin said Labor wants to avoid parliamentary scrutiny because of the public backlash about it knowingly promising at least $1.5 billion to support the gas industry. The Central West Environment Council, or CWEC, has called on the New South Wales government to close production at Newcrest's Cardia Holdings gold mine near Orange to protect the community from toxic dust poisoning water tanks. Toxic dust has been blowing off the Cadia Mines evaporative tailings dams since a collapse in 2018. Multiple personal blood tests show evidence of dangerous levels of metals. The pollution uh, is reported to have spread up to 50 kilometres across the region and high contamination levels have been found in drinking water tanks. 83% of the water samples contain lead, almost 30% of which were 10 times higher than safe guidelines. Other materials found included nickel, arsenic, cadmium and mercury. There are no filters on exhaust fans at the mines and CWEC has called on New South Wales Environment Minister Penny Sharp to halt dangerous mining projects. Public housing tenants were emotional as they told a protest on Gadigal land in Sydney that they did not want to be removed from homes they have lived in for decades. The Housing for People Not Profit protest organised by Action for Public Housing heard from tenants, housing activists, students, unionists and MPs about real solutions to the housing crisis. Rally co-chairs Rachel Evans and Ishbel Dunsmore said Sydney is in the midst of one of the worst housing crises ever and the government must be forced to change its approach. Evans said the New South Wales and Federal Labor Party's plans are set to make this crisis worse and that the Housing Future Fund, if it gets up, will only fund homes for 12% of the 160,000 households on the public housing waiting list. Action for Public Housing is calling for a freeze on rents, no privatisations, and for more public housing to be built. A public forum, No More Demolitions Alternatives to Public Housing Redevelopment, is being organised by Action for Public Housing on July 18th from 6 to 8pm at Redfern Community Centre in Redfern. Now let's hear what is happening around the world. A devastating shipwreck off the coast of Greece on June 14 has left hundreds dead in one of the worst tragedies there's ever been on the Mediterranean Sea. The fishing boat carrying more than 750 refugees and migrants on their way to Italy capsized, with around 500 people still missing and 78 confirmed dead. At least 298 people on the boat, although as potentially as many as 400, were from Pakistan, and 25 came from the same village in the Pakistan-administered Jammu and Kashmir area. But the Pakistani government and mainstream media was quick to blame human traffickers and risk-taking youth for boarding the ship in a classic case of victim blaming, but little attention was paid to the reasons why people might flee their homes in the first place. Pakistan, like many other countries, has extreme inequality, with the richest 1% owning 16.8% of the wealth, the richest 10% owning 25.5%, and the poorest 40% only owning 25%. The rich continue to capture new wealth while 38% of the country is in poverty. The other element is the fortress Europe policies of rich countries with strict militarised borders that aim to stop people seeking asylum. These rich countries in Europe, but also Australia and the US, continue to pilfer wealth from the global south at the same time as they criminalise refugees. Let's hope that this tragedy forces some to rethink these brutal and inhuman policies. 
Yeah, it's terrible what happened to those people and others seeking a better life around the world. But there are some who are resisting repressive governments and fighting for change. And I was fortunate enough to speak to Burmese educator, academic and human rights activist Mong Zani ahead of his participation in the upcoming Eco-Socialism 2023 conference. He explained that it is now the third year of the anti-coup resistance in Burma, with the overwhelming majority of Burmese public servants, teachers, doctors, nurses, accountants, all involved in the anti-coup resistance. Zani said that earlier, predictions that the Burmese armed forces were too powerful um, have proven false and that the resistance movement is gaining serious ground. He said younger generations are unhappy with the regressive values in Burmese society and want change. He said the resistance had brought together many different ethnic communities but had not done enough to include the Rohingya people who are the victims of genocide by the armed forces in Myanmar. Sri Lanka is approaching the one-year anniversary of the resignation of President Gotabaya Rajapaska on July 13, following the popular uprising triggered by shortages of food, medicine and fuel. One year on, the social struggle continues, and while the economy has recovered slightly, 7 million people out of a total population of 22 million are in poverty. Hospital, school and rail unions, along with middle-class professionals, staged numerous strikes in March against a rise in income tax. They also demanded lower bank interest rates in a context of rising costs of living. The protesters highlighted the burden borne by workers while government corruption continues. Meanwhile, the military colonisation of the North and East provinces the majority of Tamil and Muslim communities, continues, with land grabbing justified and rationalised by the ruling class. Parliamentary elections have been postponed, and the government is trying to suppress dissent and protest, including introducing new laws to clamp down on progressive media and so-called anti-terror laws. The popular protests of a year ago have sown the seeds of resistance, and the galvanisation of these disparate protests into a broad counter-movement remains a key challenge for activists engaged in the struggle for democracy in Sri Lanka. So you can find all the stories we talked about today at greenleft.org.au. Eco-Socialism 2023, a world beyond capitalism, is happening this weekend, July 1st and 2nd, in Nam at Victorian Trades Hall. It's not too late to get your tickets and come along to what will be an incredible conference full of rich discussion around fighting for a better world. And this conference is open to anyone who wants to be part of that fight and features an incredible list of local and international speakers. So check out the full program and get your tickets at ecosocialism.org.au. You don't want to miss out. Green Left needs your support to continue. You can become a supporter for only $5 a month and donate to our 2023 fighting fund to help us make more content like this. Go to greenleft.org.au slash support to help us out. And remember to follow Green Left on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and TikTok for the latest news and analysis. Thanks for listening.